Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hallwitt, and I'm a program officer at Mass Humanities. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the first event in our Let's Talk About Democracy series. I want to let you know uh, that we are recording this event tonight. And to uh, help us be able to focus on the speakers, we're going to ask you to please keep your video turned off during the event. Um, if your video is turned on, um, you can turn it off by just hovering your cursor at the bottom right of the screen and then clicking on the picture of the camera. Our technical support facilitator tonight is Ashley Ayala. I'd like to thank her for her help, and she may also jump in um, to turn off your video for those of you who are not sure how to do it. As many of you know, um, as many of you know, Mass Humanities is a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we support public humanities projects across the Commonwealth. We take seriously the call in the founding legislation for the NEH that democracy demands wisdom. And we offer this series as a means of taking a few small steps in cultivating our own wisdom at this moment in our nation's history, when many Americans from across the political spectrum are worried about the future of our democracy. Tonight, we look at American history to help us gain some perspective on our current moment by studying periods in our history when our democracy has seemed to be in peril our two panelists have identified four threats that have tended to weaken the pillars of our democracy. What can we learn from this history that can help us understand where we are today? That's the central question we'll be exploring tonight. In our second event in this series, A Dialogue on Democracy, we shift from exploring broader historical contexts to looking more deeply at ourselves. We will invite participants into small group structured conversations, each led by a facilitator, to reflect on our own values and what um, really matters to us when we think about democracy. And we'll listen to the views of others, not so we can change their views, but with the intention of building understanding perspectives that may differ from our own. In the third event on the potential of civic renewal to revive our democracy, we will turn to what we can each do to strengthen one of the pillars of vibrant democratic societies, which is a strong civil society. Civil society is what our moderator today, Peter Levine, calls politics at the human scale where ordinary people, the more diverse the better, work together collaboratively and deliberatively to strengthen our communities. Many of you I know are already doing this and we will make time for conversations at that event in breakout rooms for you to share your experiences and brainstorm ideas with each other. So let me begin now by welcoming Peter Levine. Um, Peter, if you wanna turn on your video, um, he's a philosopher by training and a passionate advocate for civics education and civic engagement. Professor Levine is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Lincoln Filing Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Tufts University in the Jonathan Tisch College of Civic Life. He's currently working on a book called What Should We Do? Political Theory with Citizens at Our Center. And at the third event in this series on December 10th, we're gonna be talking with him about um, the ideas that he discussed in an earlier book he wrote called We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America. Today, Professor Levine will be moderating a conversation with Suzanne Mettler and Robert Lieberman. And if you both want to turn on your videos, um, they are the co-authors of a new book called Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. And um, we're so honored to have both of you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Suzanne Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions in the Government Department at Cornell University. She is a prolific scholar and award-winning author whose research and teaching focus on American political development, public policy, and political behavior. She's the co-convener of the American Democracy Collaborative, a group of scholars who assess the health of American democracy in the United States, and was a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow in 2019. Robert Lieberman is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University, and a former provost and senior vice president of academic affairs at Johns Hopkins. Also a prolific scholar, he studies American political development and po public policy, and is an award-winning author of books exploring race and American politics. With Professor Mettler, he is a co-convener of the American Democracy Collaborative, and will be heading to the University of Oxford next year as a visiting scholar. Before we begin our conversation, I just want to draw your attention to the chat feature in Zoom. Um, you will see if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen um, that there's a chat feature. When you click on that, you can see a drop-down menu where you can choose who to send chat messages to. 
Um, if you're having any technical difficulties that we can help with, you can either chat me or uh, Ashley Ayala. Um, we're going to be taking questions from all of you in the audience about 15 minutes or so uh, before the end of our event. And I'd like you to please direct questions uh, directly to our moderator, Peter Levine, and you can do that in the chat. Uh, and so with that, let me pass it to you, Professor Levine, uh, to get us started. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It's fun to do this. Um, thanks, Suzanne and Rob, for joining. Um, thanks to all the friends for coming here tonight. Actually, some people on the participant list are friends, and I'm glad to see you, and, and I'm glad to meet everybody else. Um, so we're going to have a discussion of this book. I just want to say uh, very quickly that it's a really good read. Um, it's, it's not necessarily cheerful. Um, that is to say, if, even if many people joining this call are already a little worried about democracy, I think the book might make you even slightly more so. But it is a compelling read. It's, um, it's a strong narrative. Um, it's, it's full of, uh, of anecdotes that you probably haven't heard before that are not just there for color, but that are there to make some serious points. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. It's also not, not very long, although it's, it's a true substantial book. Um, and so we, we wanted to start by, so you should buy it, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but we wanted to start by trying to uh, get across just some of the very basics of the book. And so my, the, it, the title is Four Threats. So I, I first want to ask, um, I think Suzanne was going to answer, but either of you answer, what are the four threats? Just, just tell people what they are hey, and why great. they're important. Well, uh, first of all, delighted to be here with you tonight. And thank you so much for, for welcoming us. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, in writing this book, we learned a lot from scholars who study democracy around the world and who look at what makes democracies thrive and what makes them deteriorate. And we learned from them that there are these four threats. So the first one is political polarization. So democracy works well when in society there are multiple groups and identities and people have overlapping and what we call cross-cutting affiliations. So in other words, you might associate with uh, one party or the other, but in your workplace or the civic organizations you belong to or your place of work worship, you might associate with people who belong to the other party. What's problematic is when society sorts itself out so that these differences increasingly line up and society starts to feel like two camps of us versus them. And at that point, politics ceases to be a process involving negotiation and accommodation. It becomes like mortal combat where opponents seem like enemies. The second threat is what we call conflict over the boundaries of the political community or conflict over who belongs. Democracy works well when people in a nation agree on who is a member and what their status is. Now, if there's some unresolved formative rift in the nation's founding over who's included, uh, that can reemerge as a source of trouble again and again, whether it's over race or ethnicity or gender, whatever. And in the periods that we examine, paddle, battles over race take center stage um, time and again, particularly concerning those who are most overtly excluded in the founding African-Americans. The third threat is rising economic inequality. Countries where inequality is high and growing are more likely to suffer democratic deterioration. Now, when we started this project, I assumed the reason why was that the 99% would rise up and have a revolution. But in fact, that's not what scholars have learned. It's the other way around. The affluent, uh, when there's high inequality, the affluent become worry that the masses are going to impose redistributive policies and higher taxes that they won't like. So in order to protect their interests, they seek to solidify their power and they're willing to support repressive measures to do so if that's what it takes. And then the fourth and final threat is executive aggrandizement. In other words, the enlargement and concentration of the powers of the nation's top leader, meaning in the United States, the president. And this can lead to the demise of checks and balances and make a nation more prone to tyranny. Now, you know, certainly in the United States, um, the uh, executive power has been growing ever since the 1930s. It grew uh, for the most part in response to the public's demands for government to be responsive and to do things um, for the economy, society, and then also for national security. But it means that presidents have at their disposal these tools that they can use for their own personal and political gain if they're inclined to do so. 
Great. So the so the four threats. Well, actually, we we can reprise them by showing the chart, which we'll show in a second. So um, the other so one dimension of the book is four threats. The other dimension is a series of previous crises. Um, that have involved these threats, which which ends up telling a story of American history in some ways. And so um, I'm going to ask, I think Robert's going to do this, talk talk us through the story. And should I should I show the... Uh, yeah, that would be great if you could put up the slide now. Yeah, so um, this is a table from the book, and um, it is a helpful cheat sheet for the book yeah. as a whole. So first, let me add my uh, thanks to, uh, to Suzanne's. I'm really delighted to be with you all uh, tonight. Um, sorry it couldn't be in person, but uh, we'll have to make do. So what we, what we did was we, um, in the book, we examine these five historical periods. And these are moments that we noted from a scan of American history are periods when Americans were genuinely concerned that democracy seemed to be at risk or that we seemed to be um, at a danger of what we call backsliding, moving backward, moving toward um, a less complete, less robust democracy. So even if you recognize that at the beginning of the Republic, um, the United States was not a complete democracy, that most people were excluded from citizenship, African Americans, women, um, Native Americans, and so on and so forth. Generally, we like to think of American history as um, moving forward sort of inexorably toward a more complete, more robust democracy. But there were these five periods that we study when, um, when people were genuinely scared that democracy might move backward, and in some cases it did. And what we found was that these uh, periods were all characterized by at least one, and in some cases, combinations of threats, and it's the combinations of threats that we found are particularly um, dangerous. So beginning at the beginning, um, in the 1790s, the first decade of the Republic, right out of the box, um, uh, we, uh, the country devolved very quickly into um, not just disagreements over the financial plan and the bank and this sort of thing, but into really deep antagonism between two polarized camps, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, um, uh, that without belaboring the history ends up in this um, convulsive uh, election of 1800, um, which really almost tears the, the country apart after a decade of the Whiskey Rebellion and the Alien and Sedition Acts and real partisan warfare. There was real fear of violence um, around the election of 1800. Several state governors mobilized their militias um, in case the election went the wrong way. Um, um, so even polarization by itself uh, was able to wreak havoc with, with what the, at the time was still a fledgling uh, democracy. Um, later on, in the as the 19th century progressed, additional threats sort of piled on polarization. Um, so in both the 1850s and the 1890s, we were in such a circumstance where three threats not just polarization, but also conflict over race, over membership, um, and rising economic inequality combined. Um, in the 1850s, you get uh, an explosive conflict over slavery that ends in civil war in 1861. Um, in the 1890s, you get a, a, a violent um, repri reprisal against the democratization that had happened in the South during Reconstruction. Um, that ends up with the establishment of Jim Crow and the um, uh, disenfranchisement of millions of African American men who had won um, political rights, voting rights, and, um, and won political power in the South during the previous decades. Um, and that, that exclusion, that new, that sort of recovered exclusion um, lasts until the 1960s. Um, so the, when threats combine, it's, it can be extremely dangerous for democracy. Um, those th the other three threats, the first three threats begin to wane a little bit in the 20th century. And the 20th century then is the, the, the period, the century of executive aggrandizement, the growth of the power of the presidency, beginning early in the 20th century, um, really taking root uh, in the 1930s with the New Deal and the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, and um, coming home to roost in a sense in the 1970s. Uh, with the Watergate scandal, which is really, um, I could talk about Watergate all night, but for your sake, I won't, um, which is really a, a sort of very small tip of a very large iceberg of a president using the newly grown powers of the presidency 
for his own um, political uh, purposes, to punish his enemies, to advance his own uh, cause. Um, well, fast forward now to the present, and for the first time in American history, all four of these threats, polarization, conflict over membership in the political community, rising economic inequality, and growing executive power exist at the same time, which leads us to the conclusion um, that the, the, the current moment, and by that we mean not just you know, today, although we could talk about today, literally today, um, and not even just the Trump presidency, but the, the last decade or so, um, we regard that this as a, a very grave crisis for American democracy. Let's actually talk about um, today. So or not necessarily today, today, but the last month. So you did write the book uh, recently, but not after the 2020 election. So does the, does the election result or the turnout or the uh, president's behavior afterwards or the Senate's behavior afterwards give you any new insights or you're not throwing the book away, I don't think, but what, what are you thinking most recently? Right. So um, coming out of this election, of course, there are some things that are going very well for democracy. And the fact that we had such high voter turnout, the highest since the early 20th century is extraordinary, particularly in the midst of a pandemic, um, that people found a way to, to get out and vote or to use their mail-in ballots. It's truly extraordinary. And the election occurred without any violence happening, even though there'd been a lot of, of worry about that. Um, and a candidate was elected who uh, throughout talked about the need to protect democracy. Um, so all of that's very positive, and yet we're still worried. Um, there are you know, such persistent concerns that of course begin with the fact that, um, that President Trump has not conceded. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I think the much bigger concerns to us are the way that um, President Trump, after you know, and end Republican leaders after months of during a pandemic, making it more difficult for Americans to vote, slowing down the postal service, trying to discourage people from using mail-in ballots, associating them with fraud, and now since the election, saying that not all the votes should be counted and challenging lots of votes in lots of places and doing this in so many different ways on a you know daily basis we're seeing more ways this is happening we're having you know a u.s senator speaking to the secretary of state in georgia lindsey graham um, and saying you know you should not count the ballots from several of these counties um, is it's deeply disturbing and it's it's really troubling i would say that there's two broad problems to us and you know the bottom line is these threats are not going away and they're still being exacerbated. This kind of polarization and divisiveness in our society is still being exacerbated and this is danger to free and fair elections. So that's happening in a couple of ways. One is that, you know, if you go back just about six years and you look at public opinion polls and Americans' views of our elections in the United States, Dem the vast majority of both Democrats and Republicans thought we had free and fair elections and that you could respect the legitimacy of the outcome even if the person you voted for didn't win. That has changed very quickly and it began to change when uh, Donald Trump was a candidate um, in 2015 and 2016 and it's, it's gotten much worse now. So, you know, right now there are, are polls showing that over 70% of Republicans uh, feel that the election was not fair, that um, that Biden's victory is not fair and that it's based on fraud. That's deeply troubling for the future legitimacy of government. It's, it's you know, in the more immediate sense, it's difficult for, it will be difficult for um, President-elect Biden once uh, he's inaugurated to accomplish goals on behalf of the American people broadly. But I think that's only at the beginning. The other issue is that with, um, with President Trump and Republican leaders trying to get state and local officials who run elections to act like partisans instead of um, neutral professionals who are trying to do their best 
for the country to have free and fair elections. That's very disturbing. And so far, we've been lucky that there are people of good conscience who are willing to ignore that. But what if it was a much closer election and there were a handful of people who were not so conscientious? It could be really troubling. Unmute yourself is the is the slogan of 2020, right? It's the so um, I've got to do that. Did you want to add to that, Rob? Yeah, um, no, I would. I think that's that's all right. It's 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 very uh, disturbing. Um, but I think what's important to remember is that even though the president is behaving, you know, historically badly in in this whole dispute, this is not just a Trump problem. This is a, a, a symptom of this context in which the threats pile up, um, which is essentially an invitation for partisans um, to behave like teams who want to win at all costs. Um, and uh, and the, so the, the president's behavior and the, you know, the fact that Republicans are sort of lockstep in line behind him um, are all uh, uh, more of a commentary on the times, in a sense, than a commentary on this or that individual. So how do you, this, this question is a little out of order, you're expecting it later, but how do you um, navigate the question of, of nonpartisanship in your, own, in your own analysis, in your own writing? So, because on one hand, you, you take partisan polarization to be a threat, and you point to past episodes like the election of 1800, where the two parties are both, um, denouncing the opposite party for not being part of the legitimate system at all. And you point, you know, you point to the problem of affective partisanship of people not liking the other party, which is pretty dramatic. Um, but on the other hand, you, you, and maybe this is where you have to be, but you say things like, um, right now, one party has led the way to exacerbating several of the four threats. Guess which one? The Republican Party has abandoned its willingness to protect the pillars of democracy the Democratic Party today is faced with the obligation of defending democracy. So, so my question is, are you, are, you, are you contributing to the problem or is this a dilemma that there is no solution to? What, what, are you nonpartisan is, is sort of the blunt way to put the question. Yeah, so um, as we wrote the book, we really um, kept that question on the back burner about, you know, is one party or the other to blame today? Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, we worked our way through studying all of these periods and, and trying to really understand how these dynamics work of the four threats and what happens when they begin to interact and combine with each other, et cetera. And then um, it helped us, I think, to understand the contemporary period better. So, you know, polarization has been growing for decades now um, and uh, at an accelerated rate. And there are reasons that, you know, start with ordinary citizens from like at least the 1960s onward of, of Southerners um, no longer being Democrats, becoming Republicans instead, and the shifts this caused in the party. Um, and uh, then, you know, there's a story of Republican leaders then realizing that the party could be more competitive if they would use strategies that would help it to do so. And they began to play hardball, uh, beginning with, you know, Newt Gingrich, Dick Cheney by the late 1970s in Congress. Um, and, they be and the party begins to become really competitive in congressional elections. Um, and, uh, but certainly it's a two-way street and Democrats lead to this hardball as well. And uh, you know, both parties, political scientists find this, that both parties shifted away from their focus on policy making and started to put more resources into public relations so they could try to distinguish themselves from each other. They're always thinking about winning the next election. Um, but when we get to the last decade, really, and that's when we start to see damage to the, what we call the pillars of democracy. Um, and so um, it's when that damage occurs that, you know, it's really troubling. So, so the pillars of democracy are free and fair elections, the rule of law, the legitimacy of the opposition, and the integrity of rights, meaning civil liberties, civil rights, and voting rights. And uh, so, you know, as the, um, the Voting Rights Act gets weakened by the Supreme Court, more states at, at this point um, with Republican leadership are adopting voter identification laws. And then you have um, 
uh, Barack Obama's last year in office, Justice Scalia dies, Merrick Garland is, is put forward by Obama, and Mitch McConnell says too close to the election. So this is, you know, violating the idea of the legitimacy of the opposition and their right to govern. Um, but then we move into the Trump presidency, and uh, you know that's when we really, especially in this past year, see a great acceleration of damage to um, the rule of law. Uh, and, and with you know uh, Trump's treating the Department of Justice as if it's his private law firm, for example, the kind of threats to free and fair elections that we we're mentioning earlier, uh, and these other things as well. So, um, so we don't, uh, we are unwilling at this point to say it's both sides because we really see the damage being inflicted, particularly by the Republican Party, in their effort to win at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, think, I think that's all right. And I think, again, this is a symptom um, or a consequence of the combination of threats. I mean, the Republican Party, it's not just that the Republican Party has become extreme, but the Republican Party is now sort of taking sides in all of these, on all of these dimensions. The Republican Party is increasingly a white party um, and a party of people who hold uh, racially resentful views. Um, it's increasingly a party of plutocracy of the 1% um, against the 99%. And, you know, as Suzanne said in the last few years, when that party um, has controlled the presidency, which is now an extremely powerful uh, office, um, the, the sort of motive and both motive and opportunity and means are all there, um, if you're a fan of mystery novels, um, for the crime to be committed. So. Um, so the conditions have conspired to sort of push the Republican Party into that position. The Democrats over time are not uh, blameless, but, um, but, but I agree with Suzanne right now, the Republicans, and you can see this, you know, in the headlines down to the hour, you know, it's, it's, it's the Republicans who are calling for the results of the election to be subverted, not the Democrats. Great. So uh, we're getting some good questions, which you can't see. They're, they're being sent to me privately. People should send me more. That's great. I want to get to them soon and not uh, take up all the time with my questions. But there is a, a really important theme, I think, that Suzanne mentioned in her summary, but I think we need to give it a little more attention, which is, so as, as I'm reading the book, I'm struck by two things. One is how, 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 how the Republic is hung by a thread on a number of occasions, and it has really been lucky or not entirely probable that it would survive. Um, and the second is that each time we get out of a real jam, it's at the expense of African Americans. It's it's often at the expense of a larger group, but it's always blacks. Um, so so the perfect example being that you have this terrible partisan conflict in the election of eighteen hundred. Um, see the see the, Ham the the musical Hamilton for for a dramatic rendition of that. But slavery at that point is not the prime issue. When slavery emerges as the prime issue, the elites on both parties or the, all the elites decide that they agree uh, to preserve slavery. And so you get what you may remember from your high school textbook as the era of good feelings, but it's the era of good feelings, one at the expense of enslaved African-Americans. So this has happened over and over again. Um, the question though, is, so can we, can we do better? So that's as, as completely unacceptable to do that again. So that can't be the solution. It also strikes me as it's maybe impossible to do it again, given that African-Americans are actually a pretty powerful block within the Democratic Party. Um, it might not actually be possible for elites to um, do that again. So what, what are your thoughts about, about that, the, the role that race and particularly the white-black binary has played in American history, but also the prospects of getting out of this without repeating that sin? Yeah, this was a um, really sobering um, finding that we came upon again and again um, about the settlement and, and what it entails. Um, and so, um, you know, as, as you were mentioning, Peter, in, that's true that in the 1790s, um, while you had great polarization emerged very quickly, it was really striking, even with, you know, the people, many of the people who were the framers of the Constitution and had been very much against um, uh, political parties forming, they begin to form them pretty quickly early on. And then you have the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans um, disagreeing about, it seemed like everything, but they're not disagreeing on slavery. And there's uh, an historian who's done an analysis that finds that 
if um, the three fifths clause did not exist in 1800, where you know we think of this as an election where there was this successful peaceful transfer of power for the first time from the, the Federalists to the Democratic Republicans to Jefferson becoming president, but Jefferson would not have had the most votes. Um, were it not for the three fifths clause, and in fact, then the Federalist John Adams would have stayed. You know, um, the president would have won re-election. So, um, so you have that kind of dynamic of leaving racial hierarchy intact, which happens in some of these periods. It happens again in the 1930s, where that time the party, the the conflict. Um, is within the Democratic Party, and the, the settlement within that party is that, you know, Roosevelt and the Northern Democrats decide we are going to leave the racial hierarchy alone so that we can enact all of these other major policies like the Social Security Act and so on that um, excludes African Americans by excluding domestic workers and agricultural workers and so on. Um, FDR does not challenge the South on, um, he does not support an anti-lynching law and so on. And so, um, you know, the country manages to navigate this really difficult period when a lot of Americans thought we were going to go down the road of authoritarianism. Um, and Roosevelt manages to expand executive power, but to keep liberal democracy intact. And yet it's at the costs of African Americans were not included in all of these new social rights that white Americans gained at the time. And then, of course, as you know, Rob was mentioning, in the 1890s, you have this other dynamic. There, there's major backsliding, and the cost is paid by African Americans in particular, who lose voting rights. And then once they've lost voting rights, they lose political rights. Um, once they lose, excuse me, once they lose political rights, they lose uh, civil liberties and civil rights as well, and Jim Crow becomes established. So it's a period of major backsliding. Um, so you have, you know, those two different dynamics. So it's very sobering. And the question is, today, can we do something different? And today, what's happening, we see that today you have this combination of political polarization and conflict over who belongs. They're aligning with each other. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's arguably one source of polarization is that the Democratic Party, um, I think more than perhaps any party in American history, is in favor of expanded equality. And we look at that when we look at the, uh, the, the attitudes of white Democrats have become increasingly embracing of equality over recent years. By contrast, white Republicans um, are hiring, hiring scoring higher on what we, what we call racial resentment um, scores. So um, the parties have grown apart in that respect. Um, but one thing that Rob and I, you know, since the book came out that we found actually really encouraging was in the wake of the protests this summer after the killing of George Floyd, it seemed that, well, for one thing, in those protests, um, they were very diverse, lots of white Americans, were, were marching as well as people of color. They were taking place not only in major cities in the United States, but in a lot of smaller cities and small towns all across the country. And in public opinion polls, it seemed to suggest that a majority of Americans have become more supportive of doing something about racial injustice um, through, the, through policing. Um, and so uh, the question is now, can we try to move forward on that? We um, also a question about how to move forward. We have actually a couple of different people. Um, I'll say their names in a second, but they, they've both they've sort of both asked about prosecuting um, Trump and the idea that if if he's assaulting um, some of the pillars and he's doing it in an illegal way, um, isn't uh, the solution than than a legal one. And um, that also raises the question, though, because there's presumably an argument that one of the other threats is polarization, and and that the last thing. Um, a Democratic president should be doing is is prosecuting a predecessor because it would exacerbate um, polarization. So I'm, I'm referring to Anna Castrillon and uh, um, Jay Kaufman's uh, question. And Jay, hi Jay, <laughs> I know Jay. Um, so thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you put your the, the questions together, put their finger on the dilemma. Um, that is, if if we find that that the president has committed crimes in the conduct of his presidency, then the right thing to do um, from a legal standpoint, from a moral standpoint is probably to prosecute him. 
Um, but this is ultimately a political question. I think, um, you know, in the context of such deep and intense polarization and in the context of the belief that, that Suzanne alluded to a few minutes ago, um, you know, the widespread belief among Republicans, not just elite Republican office holders, but Republican affiliated citizens, the widespread belief that this election is not legitimate and that a Biden presidency will be illegitimate. I think, um, I, you know, I fear that the risk of exacerbating polarization if say the Biden Justice Department were to prosecute Trump uh, uh, for things that he did as president in the, his conduct of the presidency, um, I, I fear that that might be inflammatory and I'm not sure what purpose that would serve for either the Democrats or for the nation other than some kind of catharsis. Um, and I'm not sure that's enough of a purpose. Now, this is separate from whatever the you know, New York State Attorney General right. wants to do because of, with the company. We might um, sort of broaden the question a little. When I was reading your book, it was before the election, but not too far before. And it looked, I mean, there were all kinds of possibilities, including a Trump re-election. But one possibility was Biden winning and, and getting a Senate majority. And so then as I was reading, I was given your framework of four threats and such. I was thinking there's a dilemma here because forget about prosecuting Trump. There'd be a lot of things that the um, that a Democratic Congress and president could do that would address the other threats. So they, they, could, they could make sure that people aren't being excluded. Um, they could change, they could uh, work against economic inequality. Um, but doing those things would be, um, would require um, playing hardball. It would require things like getting rid of the filibuster. And so there's the potential that it would raise the, that it would raise that fourth threat, the, the partisanship threat, and even another notch. Um, so now it's sort of a little bit moot because it doesn't seem as if um, there's going to be a very ambitious legislative agenda. But I still want to pose the question because you could look, think it a little bit broader, not just, not just next month, but uh, for example, two years from now, there'll be another election. Two years after that, there'll be another one. I mean, should um, you, you, you call on the Democrats to save the democracy? Um, I'm quoting you and I'm paraphrasing you closely when I say that. So should the Democrats be pushing to attack the other three threats or should they be worrying about um, exacerbating polarization or can they can they somehow navigate that? Is there a way through that? Well, I do think that, you know, it's uh, it's going to be challenging for Democrats doing uh, going forward through legislation, but um, I think that they can give it their their level best. I think that the, um, you know, the House will pass legislation. Um, and the question is, what will happen in the Senate? Um, and so, you know, ideally, if, um, you know, if, if there was more support for it than I fear there will be, um, voting rights should be strengthened. Um, and uh, so should some of the things like, you know, inspectors generals that, um, that Trump has run roughshod over. Um, and all sorts of, of ways of strengthening the rule of law. I mean, things like um, requiring presidents going forward to, um, to share their, their taxes with the country when they're actually a candidate um, could be important for, um, you know, um, the, the emoluments clauses, which have not been enforced um, during these past four years. Um, so there are all of those kinds of things. You know, it's striking to think about how coming out of Watergate, the country really came together. Democrats and Republicans came together in Congress to uh, create all sorts of reforms uh, along these lines, but it's going to be much harder for us now. Um, and so, um, and you know, and then in, in addition to trying to, to strengthen those pillars of democracy, um, if Democrats had had, you know, greater um, strength in the Senate, they could have done things to try to reduce economic inequality, for example, you know, scaling back that major threat um, with different tax policy, with increased minimum wage. There may still be a possibility of bipartisan support for a strengthened, uh, a stronger federal minimum wage um, and, uh, and various other, other things. So what Biden will be able to do, of course, and, and this is going to illustrate kind of the catch-22 of where we're at politically, is that he can work through the administrative state. But, you know, that comes back to this problem of, of executive aggrandizement. Now, you know, there's much he can do simply by staffing the administrative state with competent people who are going to uphold the rule of law. 
um, and you know that that can can help us out a great deal. Um, more ambitious things, you know, what's happened in recent decades is that presidents of both parties, because they have trouble accomplishing their agenda through Congress, then they turn to their executive powers and they do things to satisfy the activists in their own party. Um, and, uh, you know, and each party that's out of power gets angry at the other and feels there's an abuse of executive power, um, which there is. But this is the dilemma of where we're at with polarization. Um. We so I get to see all the all the questions and um, they're good. There, there's there one um, set of questions is really I think challenging you guys a little bit. I'm not sure if that's the intent, but challenging you um, by saying, look, if the Democrats are equally complicit or at least very complicit in causing in or, or allowing economic inequality and resulting racial division. So it's it's a I think a critique from the left of both parties saying um, this this idea that. Uh, especially lately the republicans have been causing the economic inequality is not fair because the democrats have been too so that's that's one question i'm wondering if either of you want to answer it i'll let it float there for a second but the other kind of questions are saying i think they came up mostly when rob was talking about um reasons not to prosecute trump and the, basically the argument is if you don't prosecute somebody who breaks the law then you're undermining democracy because you're allowing impunity and allowing the president to be above the law and you've just sort of given away the game so um, so two questions. One, are the Democrats equally complicit with, uh, with uh, causing inequality? And the second one is, can, can democracy survive um, impunity for a former president? I think, I mean, I think that the question, taking the second question first, I think that puts, the, puts a finger exactly on the dilemma. I mean, it's, you know, the idea that we should let a president get away with, um, you know, take your pick, make a list. Um, doesn't sit well, and it does not uphold the rule of law and the idea of democratic accountability, um, as we saw through the impeachment uh, process. Um, you know, the president was impeached. Uh, there were pretty strong evidence to suggest that he had, in fact, done the things that he was accused of doing by the House, um, and the and the Senate backed him up, and that was undertake. A lot of people took that as exactly what the questioners are, are describing, you know, the president getting away with stuff. Um, and that by itself undermining the rule of law and undermining the pillars of, of democratic accountability. Um, the dilemma though is the, you know, so all of that, all of that could be strengthened by, you know, taking a careful look at the things that he did when he was in office. On the other hand, if we think that this sort of um, poisonous polarization and conflict between the parties um, is part of the problem, um, and that's going to be seriously inflamed by, you know, the Congress, say, or the Justice Department um, spending time on that and making the Democrats or the president look like they're just, you know, now they're in the catbird seat and they're going to... Um, uh, they're going to take on the opposition in the same way that the Republicans did. Um, that risks in making things worse. Um, I think one of the another challenge for Biden in this regard is that he is has already said this, um, but he's going to have to take a fairly hands-off position vis-a-vis -vis the Justice Department um, and let the Justice Department resume its posture of uh, of independence um, and let the professionals in the Justice Department sort of figure out what makes sense from a legal point of view and pursue cases where the evidence leads them. Um, and may, so I think his ability to direct that kind of activity from the White House is going to be probably rightly kind of compromised. So yeah, there's no good answer here. Um, I, I think what we want to point out is the political dilemma that this moment creates for, you know, a Biden presidency in the wake of a Trump presidency. It's not, you know, we're not saying Trump should get away with stuff. Um, I think I think some you may be getting some pushback to the idea that it's a dilemma at all. I think some people. Yeah, think no, I can I can I can I can understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but you know, none, no, nothing, no action like that is going to be without some kind of consequence for precisely these dynamics that we're trying to describe. And that what you know, I think it's worth thinking through what those will be. Um, on on the first question, um, I don't know if Suzanne has thoughts yeah. about this, but it seems to me—I mean, it seems to me that yes, the Democrats are complicit, but that in the last decade or so, less so than the Republicans. I don't know if you want to 
Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, I would say, um, you know, if you uh, go back to, you know, the 1980s, since the Reagan era, um, if you look at social welfare policy, the Republicans have wanted to scale back policies, or at least that's been their, you know, their stated preference. In fact, um, you know, those policies for the most part have remained intact. Um, many of them are, uh, are they're less in the, um, their benefits um, are a lower value now than they were in the past, but there's been a lot of expansion of them. And actually some of the Democrats have protected them hard um, back in the 1980s, like during the George H.W. Bush administration, um, there was actually some bipartisan strengthening of policies, you know, making Medicaid more expansive at the time, more generous. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you move to the contemporary period and um, the Affordable Care Act was, you know, which a major accomplishment of having health care policy that reaches working age Americans, a goal Democrats had sought since, you know, Harry Truman. Finally, Barack Obama is the president to sign that into law. And why does it happen then? And I, I, I say this to explain why I think Democrats haven't been able to come through as well on their goals as they would have liked to have is that um, many of these goals are, there was not broad bipartisan agreement on them, particularly on healthcare reform. And Democrats uh, since 1980 only had two instances where you had a Democratic president and majorities of Democrats in both the House and the Senate. And that was the beginning of Clinton's presidency and the beginning of Barack Obama's presidency. There were only four months in that entire period when it was a filibuster proof majority in the Senate. And that was during 2009. And that's how the Affordable Care Act got through the Senate. So, you know, it has not been uh, easy sledding for Democrats to accomplish these goals. Meanwhile, Demo uh, Republicans have enacted these uh, huge tax cuts for wealthy Americans, which has, uh, you know, those in and of themselves are redistributive toward the affluent. And it's meant that there's uh, much less there in resources for policies that could benefit lower and middle income Americans. Now, you know, I think there's more of an argument to be made if you turn to financial regulation. And there, I think, you know, there's a case to be made that Democrats could have um, been uh, much stronger advocates for average Americans than they have been. Um, but there is, you know, Dodd-Frank that, again, one of the major things that Barack Obama signed into law um, and that, you know, really needs to be strengthened going forward. Um, so now we're, now we're getting lots of questions um, and, and they're, they're interesting. Um, I want to paraphrase one, and we only have eight minutes or even less. So I'm, uh, so I apologize in advance to many questioners for not getting to your questions, which I, I'm myself appreciating. But um, if I can paraphrase a question from Joel Sachs and, and it gets um, some other support, um, is, is there a fatal flaw in the U.S. constitutional design? Is the, is the, especially given the Electoral College, the way the Senate is elected, the Supreme Court's Supremacy. I mean, is the problem here the Constitution, not the behavior of people within it? Oh Lord, um, yes. There's a fatal. There are some pretty big flaws in the constitutional design, and you hit on a couple of them. Um, particularly, um, the, I would say the malapportionment of the Senate and the Electoral College, um, all which which and which enable. Uh, minority rule, in a sense. Um, you know, you've had uh, twice in the last six elections now, um, you've had a president elected where, without, with, without even a plurality of the national popular vote. Um, you know, the Senate majority represents a, a minority of the, of the population. You now have a Supreme Court that is um, a majority of the uh, current justices of the Supreme Court were appointed by presidents who were elected president without a plurality of the popular vote, right? Bush and two by Bush and three by uh, Trump, right? So you have these minor minority rule institutions. Now, this is a particular problem right now because of the um, sharp rural urban divide between the parties, right? You have one party that represents primarily densely populated places um, on the coasts and another party that represents 
um, large swaths of land that don't have a lot of people living in them. I can say that to an audience in Massachusetts um, without getting things thrown at me. Um, but, um, um, and that dynamic between the parties, which wasn't always true, exacerbates the malapportionment of the institutions. The problem is that getting rid of these institutions is next to impossible. It would require a constitutional amendment and um, equal representation in the Senate is actually the one part of the constitution that is, according to the constitution itself, unamendable. So we're stuck with that. Um, you know, there are possibly statutory ways around the electoral college problem. And I think um, after this election, you might see some serious attention to uh, reform of the way we um, apportion electors. Um, but Actually, but yeah, yeah, but I think I think I think that's um, I think that's a real uh, I think that's a real flaw. One of our participants, but he hasn't actually asked a question, is Alex Kazar from uh, from Harvard, who is the expert on the electoral, the world's expert on the electoral college. Um, um, so we we actually need to wind up in just a couple minutes. We have to give um, space back to Jennifer right at the end. But can I just ask you? Um, we, we we've had some questions about the role of leaders and elites in in causing the problem and solving it. But the other half of the equation is people. Um, so here you are talking to 103. Um, Massachusetts citizens and others. Um, what what is what is the role for us in dealing with this crisis? Are you just telling us we're doomed, or are you get, or are you asking us to do something? Um, well, I think that um, what was really instructive to me in writing this book was focusing in on what are these features of democracy that make it strong. And looking at the, these pillars of, you know, the, the rule of law, the integrity of rights, free and fair elections. And uh, I think that, um, you know, after World War II, um, in that period of time, Americans put a lot of focus on like civic education and thinking about what's necessary for good citizenship and what makes democracy work. And that we've kind of gotten away from that. And our notion now has to do more with, you know, just being an activist. Um, I think, you know, our constitution is not about to change because that's such a heavy lift. Um, that what's really important is to learn how to um, work within our constitutional system um, and to really try to work across boundaries to create change. To, to create major legislative change in the United States, takes building big coalitions. It does not happen unless you can build big coalitions. And that means that we have to get out of our camps and manage to find ways to connect across, uh, across these differences. Um, so, you know, that's hard to do when the threats are raging, but I think we need to look for issues where that's possible. Um, you know, interestingly, for example, on criminal justice in recent years has been more um, seeming bipartisan um, possibilities uh, to look for those kinds of opportunities to move forward. Great. Thank you. Um, well, so I, I just want to thank my two colleagues, uh, Suzanne and, and Rob, for, for this conversation and for the book, which I really do recommend and uh, Jennifer for having us all in your space. And I'm going to turn it with, with sincere thanks, going to turn it back to you, Jennifer, to wrap us up. Great. Thank you so much to all of you. This was really a, you know, wonderful conversation, incredibly informative, um, really got me thinking about, um, you know, what there is to learn from these four threats, which they um, push us in different directions and how do we go about trying to manage that? You know, that's really a challenge that I think came across to me from your conversation, you know, from the conversation that you had today. So um, lots for all of us to think about and um, thank you so much again for coming. Um, I also want to just uh, invite the rest of our audience um, to join us uh, at the next two events in our series. I've put the link to our uh, events page on the Mass Humanities website. Uh, in the chat, and there you will find the links to our dialogue for Dialogue on Democracy on December 6th, uh, and our conversation with Peter Levine on the promise of civic renewal to revive our democracy on December 10th. Um, we have limited space in the Dialogue for Democracy. I think there's only a few more places left, um, but the promise of civic renewal will have plenty of room um, for everyone interested to participate, and we'll be doing a little bit of small uh, small group breakout rooms to get you talking, sharing ideas with each other. 
Um, we would also love to get your feedback on tonight's event. And uh, we really value participant feedback. It helps us strengthen these sorts of events. So I've put a link to our uh, participant feedback survey in the chat. Um, if you wanna just click on that before you leave, it's two quick uh, short questions and we'd appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, and I just wanna thank you all again for coming and to wish you all a good evening. So thanks everyone, good night. Thank you everyone, good night. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure. <laughs>